collection entitled Successful Low-Cost Domestic Sourcing, Stories from the Trenches. Today's webinar is the second installment of a four-part webinar series on low-cost domestic sourcing brought to you by USDA Rural Development. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. During the presentation, you have the ability to send questions through the questions box found on the webinar panel. The speakers will address the questions during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and everyone will receive an email with a link to view a recording of the event. Our speakers for today's webinar are Pete Eric, Senior Vice President at CGI and Monty Hamilton, CEO of Rural Sourcing Inc. Pete is a Senior Vice President leading CGI's U.S. Central and South Business Unit which includes all commercial and public sector clients in a 23-state region. His management portfolio includes large IT outsourcing, business process outsourcing, and systems integration and consulting clients in the state and local finance, retail, oil, and gas, insurance, and manufacturing se sectors. In addition, he is a member of the Executive Steering Committee that oversees core CGI offerings, including Collections 360, and Medicaid 360, as well as a member of CGI's Global Banking Council. Pete joined CGI in 2005 from Wipro, where he was a vice president responsible for Wipro's North American energy business. Prior to Wipro, he spent 10 years with AMS, managing client engagements within both the government and commercial markets. And before AMS, he served in Air Force Intelligence for nine years as a Russian linguist. We also have Monty Hamilton, CEO of Rural Sourcing Inc. Rural Sourcing provides a competitive onshore alternative to the traditional answers of IT outsourcing. As CEO, Monty is responsible for leading the strategic direction and the growth of RSI to launch 30 new high-tech hubs across the U.S. He is a South Africa speaker on the outsourcing topic, having recently been featured on CNBC, NPR Radio, and at various industry conferences. In addition, recent articles depicting RSI's innovative outsourcing model have appeared in Business Week, CNN Money Magazine, CFO Magazine, and CIO Magazine. Monty began his IT career in 1988 with Accenture. In 1995, he joined four other colleagues to build their own consulting firm, Cluxton Consulting. He was instrumental in growing Cluxton into a global strategic and systems integration firm with offices across the US and Europe. After Clarkson's acquisition of RSI, he became the CEO in 2009. With that, let me hand over the session to Pete Eric to kick off today's presentation. Pete? Hi, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'd first like to um, say uh, thanks for everybody for taking time. This is an important topic. Uh, if uh, you saw uh, the news today, uh, my company, CGI, we were uh, uh, we were able to uh, participate in a White House seminar called Insourcing American Jobs, where the President and Vice President talked about this phenomenon, this wave that we're going to talk about today, about U.S. jobs actually coming back on shore. And so this is very topical. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, please. What we're going to talk about today, what we're, I'm going to spend about 20 minutes talking about, is um, why we have developed at CGI our onshore delivery capabilities for rural centers in the U.S. Uh, really, it's client-driven. The clients and the markets are demanding this. It's becoming table stakes for a company like CGI to win in, in, in the marketplace. But it's also important for the economy. It's important for the clients. So I'm going to go over you know, what I'm hearing from the clients what we do when we look at site selections in rural U.S. and give you some case studies and some lessons learned about building these. Uh, just a little bit on CGI, we're about a four and a half billion dollar uh, publicly traded company uh, headquartered in Montreal but operations all over the world um, and we have uh, about 33,000 people uh, what we call members and so we are we have been around for about 36 years and uh, Global delivery is a huge part of what we do. We have centers all around the world, which I'll get into in a minute. But essentially, this part of our business is a rapidly growing business, and it's very important for our competitiveness. 
Next slide, please. So I have the privilege in, in my role at CGI of talking to lots and lots of executives, both on the government and the Fortune 500 side across many different sectors. And so what I feel the market is telling me as I talk to my clients is that many of the large organizations have embraced global delivery. And so it's not a, a matter of uh, the client saying, gee, I don't know whether I should go offshore, or use some kind of augmentation or additional capability in other delivery centers, software delivery centers. Uh, they've, they've all gotten that. It's really table stakes. Now they're starting to look at, well, maybe I've overbalanced. I have too much in, in a particular geography or too much with one vendor. I need to kind of what I call a rebalancing strategy. So they need to have both on-site and near-shore in terms of information technology services. They need to kind of rebalance that. So they have to have some of their suppliers on-site because there's some high-touch, uh, sometimes high-risk uh, activities that you need to have shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with your staff. And then there are intermediate tasks that you would like to have closer to your site. So onshore or nearshore makes perfect sense, but offshore is still a vital part of it. So it's not an either or for most of the large organizations. It's they have to do all of it, and they have to have a strategy to rebalance to make sure that, that they are getting the best economic value and the best risk profile for what they need. So, I really see that uh, also they're taking this rebalancing window, if you will, as an advantage to, to try to look at their mix of suppliers and partners, making sure that not every one of them looks like a cookie cutter uh, of each one. Right? So you need uh, partners that have a diversity of skill sets, of uh, talents that they can bring to bear, and also geographies. And so not everybody's going to be strong in every single geography, and you need that, that mix. Uh, I think another big thing, and, and I'm sure as you've seen the headlines in the papers, governments and businesses are keen to invest in creating jobs in America. It's the right thing to do for our country, but it's also becoming an imperative because you have to get close to, to your customers for the suppliers. The clients themselves uh, need to be able to sometimes go out and touch their work. And you know, flying halfway around the world is a little problematic when things are moving so fast. Uh, and lastly, I, you know, I just want to uh, make a point that with this rebalancing, um, the, one of the gating factors is really what's our talent pool. You know, in the U.S., if you think about it, in the last couple of years, say in the last 15 years, we went through a dot-com meltdown and a telecom meltdown. And there was a, a big offshoring push, obviously. And so that, I think, put a little bit of a chill on college grads wanting to have IT careers. Um, they were like, well, you know, uh, I want something that's got more stability. It looks like it's everything's going to go offshore. But that's certainly not the case now. And now we're going to have to play catch up and making sure that we have the right talent in our educational pipeline throughout the country to take advantage of this because there are skill sets in the IT industry that are very, very scarce. And uh, you know, the better we are as a country, as businesses, as government partnering together to figure that out, the, the better off the country is going to be. And you know, a lot of the innovation happens within the U.S. and you want some of that to be very close to the client sites. So next slide, please. The uh, onshore delivery models is very important to a company like CGI and, and many of our competitors and, and even uh, companies that aren't necessarily just IT services, hardware manufacturers, and software companies. Uh, it really does a couple things for us. It, one, the clients are demanding it. I can't, I can't go to a client and say, all right, here's my model and everything's got to fit inside this model. Uh, whether it's geography or skill sets or different centers, I have to be able to come to a client, especially the largest clients, with a flexibility in the model that says I can source this in various different ways and I can migrate it across the globe as as needed. So it really becomes table, table stakes. And you know we've been in this uh, for about in the U.S. since 2006, uh, really trying to aggressively develop these onshore 
centers to go hand in glove with our Indian operations and our Canadian operations and European operations. We've had success in Canada and Europe as well doing the same model, the, the local model. And part of our global delivery is on-site, near-shore, and offshore. So it's not one over the other. You have to have all of it. What this also does is promotes IT jobs and competitiveness. My job, my business is a labor business. You know, my my competitive edge are the people that I have and the talent that I can attract, retain, and grow. And I need that fresh blood of college graduates and and kind of entry level IT workers that will really give me the competitive edge, and I can grow them over time. And so the onshore centers become a, a fertile field for that. So it really helps a lot. Uh, and the third bullet is, you know, it supports national security objectives. There are some clients I have both in government and in some of the various commercial sectors where they can't have data outside the U.S. They don't either want it or by regulation or by national security, they can't have it. And so that, the applications, the data, all the requirements analysis, everything has to happen within the U.S. So obviously you can do that on site, but if you want the, the economic impact of, uh, of a slightly lower cost uh, center, that's where the onshore comes in. So it really does help in dealing with very sensitive data, some financial data, Patriot Act type data, or national security things. Next, please. So over the course of the last couple of years, we've, in the U.S., had a deliberate program to open up, trying to open up one rural onshore center in the U.S., one, one per year, uh, roughly. Our first center is in Lebanon, Virginia, and uh, then we opened up one in Troy, Alabama, and we have just announced one in October, uh, our latest one in Dalton, Texas, and I'll go through some details on, on the various uh, ins and outs of that. But that, that really ties into a network of 17 global delivery centers um, around the world. So it's not, these things have to be coordinated because I need to be able to do testing in one center, uh, the requirements analysis on site, and maybe application development in Europe or India and be able to shift that around as the clients need it, as I need it. Because each of the centers will have slightly different capabilities and certainly different economic models. And so I can work with the client and, and adjust that to really what they need. And so that's becoming very, very important in my business. Next slide, please. The range of services that we provide in the U.S. onshore centers, it's really kind of the full spectrum that we do in the technology field. So on the services side, we do a lot of application development and maintenance. Uh, we actually support uh, client applications from our centers. We do software integration and implementation. Testing is, is, a, is a hot item for us uh, because it's something that can be segmented, it can be packaged. Uh, it is the intersection between some business knowledge and technical knowledge, so, so that really works very well. We are also seeing uh, a need for business intelligence and data analytics because we can actually grow some of these uh, younger people and train them in some, some specialties that can be leveraged across multiple clients, especially in the business intelligence area, which is very hot. And of course, business process outsourcing. When we engage with a client, and, and in some cases, they want us to actually run the business function for them, and so it's a back office type function, uh, that is very uh, suitable to put into a rural center such as a call center or a business process back office um, operation. Now, obviously, we can do that overseas too, but sometimes the clients, uh, both for quality purposes, for low turnover, or uh, just for you know risk uh, purposes, they'll want it onshore. Uh, it does give me a flexible delivery alternative, so I can go to a client and say, listen, I can put all this on site. I can put all this in India, I can put it in Europe, or I can put it in two different places. And it's all depending on what really is going to site, uh, really meet the client needs. Uh, we implement the same quality tools and processes that we have in all of our major centers across the world. So there's a commonality of our delivery uh, mechanisms, our tools, our metrics, 
across all the delivery centers. So we make sure that uh, one doesn't get out of whack um, versus everybody else. So you know, I've got to be able to be assured that as I source work, it is being done in the same quality manner, and I can kind of get visibility into that regardless of what center it's in. Technology, again, runs the gamut from web services, database, client server. And I've, we have uh, seen this in, uh, in many different industries. So obviously, federal, state, and local government, there is a, a, a big need for this. Um, you cannot put all the work very economically in Washington, D.C. or, or uh, you know, one of the major uh, economic centers. So you need to have something like this to be able to have the economics work for the client and for your bid. Uh, banking insurance and energy, healthcare, manufacturing, retail, telecommunications, all the major industries are either using this or really starting to kick the tires on this and saying, you know, we have a lot, we have outsourced a lot of our talent. All of it's kind of probably weighted more in, in Asia, and that's a good thing, but we probably need to bring some of it back. And that's certainly what we're, that rebalancing is really uh, uh, coming on strong. Next slide, please. So the onshoring, as I would say, is it's a win-win-win. So the clients win, the U.S. economy wins, and the companies win that provide it, like CGI. So the clients, they get a low-risk solution with low attrition with a diverse skill set. Um, they get access to you know highly skilled U.S. talent at probably a 20 to 30 percent savings off of doing it in a major metropolitan area or on-site. Uh, it doesn't mean all the work that has to be done there, but you know it's it's a portion of what they do. We uh, it's high quality, it's it's efficient, it's the communication barriers are zero. All right, these are people um, that you know will culturally automatically understand what you're talking about. Often it's a, a, a hour or two away as a plane ride. So if you want to go visit your team, visit your work as a client, it's right there. Uh, so that that proximity is is a big big thing for lots of clients, and there's a ability to quickly stand this up and it's scalable. And we've proven that. The economy of workforce you get to source IT white collar jobs in rural America, where you have great feeder systems with uh, community colleges, where if you didn't have stuff like this, the the kids that would graduate to college with associates and bachelor's degrees and anything in technology related would have to move out of the area to go to you know Charlotte or, or Washington or San Francisco, which is great, but you know, you need some alternatives. And this is one way to kind of bring this stuff back home. And so I think it's just a it's a great thing for the communities, it's a great thing for the colleges. Uh, and believe me, we get a great workforce out of it. We get very motivated people very low attrition, and we pay above average wages in these rural communities. So it's a great thing for the communities. CGI, what we get out of it, I have a greater ability to, to meet the client needs in a flexible manner, which translates into winning more than my fair share of work. Um, I get to grow a US-based talent pool, and we have more opportunities for these members. Some of these members that we have in the rural shores, as they get more experience, will start going on the road to be consultants and that opens up a whole new career path for them. And certainly, we feel like it's important to, to give back to the community and to our, to our country here. So I think it's a win-win-win. And so what I like to talk about is some specifics about you know, some, some things in the trenches here. So go to the ne uh, next slide and the next one. When we go look for a site for a rural shore center, um, we very much align with what the Tech America framework looks like. So we look at the cost of doing business, what's the real estate, the laborers, you know, the labor pool, the taxes, airport access, um, any kind of state, local, and federal funding available uh, to offset this. You look at the workforce. What's very important is you've got to have the education um, the infrastructure to kind of plug into because that is your feeder system for these rural centers. You look at quality of life because you know people are going to want to have to stay there and really enjoy their life and have access to real estate. So we, we look at that and you look at the business political environment. You have to have a partnership with the local politi political environment and with the education environment. Next slide, please. 
So our case study, one case study, our first center was in Lebanon, Virginia. Uh, we um, we opened the building there in 2007. We now have 420 members, and it's still growing. Uh, it has got great proximity to the Washington, D.C. area, so there's, uh, we can take advantage of that in our, our government business. There was a strong partnership with the state of Virginia and the local, uh, local political uh, people. The cost of living is about 12.5% below the national average. There's 30 plus colleges in that general area, so there's a great feeder system. And uh, it's been a real successful story. And that worked out so well that we decided, in next slide, to open up another one. So uh, the next slide is Troy, Alabama. We opened that in, in 2010. We are now at a 250 members there. We're going to be growing that to uh, at least 350 or more. This, again, was a strong partnership with the state of Alabama, the local um, uh, government in Troy and Troy University, which is a 6,000 person university right there in Troy. Great, great ecosystem there. Cost of living is about 13% below the national average. And again, this is this has got both some of our internal functions there, it's got BPO functions in it, and we've got client work in there. And that is growing, so we, that's gone so well. The next slide is our third center, which we just announced back in, in October, is at Belton, Texas. Uh, we are going to be expanding there to 350 uh, headcount. Um, we picked Belton because it's right outside Fort Hood in Texas, which is one of the largest military installations in the country. So it has access to not only veterans, but their dependents, because it's a huge uh, a huge military base. So uh, we thought it was the right thing to do to provide veterans and their families jobs, and it's a very high-skilled, stable work workforce. Um, and we are, and the cost of living there is about 15% below the national average. So again, you can see the pattern. You're looking for places that have great educational institutions and that strong kind of government education business partnership and you've got great access to people and the cost of living and the quality of life is the quality of life high and the cost of living is a little lower. Next slide please. So, you know, who's taking advantage of this? So it's just some, some examples. We have a large federal agency that's uh, using one of it for development and testing. Uh, we have another one that's using um, some testing for some of our financial products in there as part of a large project. We have uh, some national data exchanges in there that we're providing 24 by 7 support. We have a state uh, entity that's in, again, doing testing. Uh, we have uh, some systems integration and system development for a tax system that uh, we're supporting out of one of these centers. And we also have a, a large tele telecommunications firm that we're providing both testing and software development for. And the benefits they get, they have low attrition, it's high quality, it's a lower unit cost than doing everything on site, probably not as much as if you send it all to like in India or China, but it's a, it's a great way to, to mix to have you know the balancing that I was talking about, the rebalancing. Next slide, please. So just as a recap, you know, for those three centers, we've got 450 jobs in Lebanon, 300 in, in uh, Troy, we'll have 350 in Dalton. These are all brand new white collar rural America jobs and huge impacts to the communities in the realm of $200 million a year. That's one way really to give back to, to the country, but it's great business sense too, because we are, it really is a competitive edge. So my last slide, next slide, um, some lessons learned. If you're thinking about getting into this, if you're going to open up centers, my, my lessons learned is A, the model works, but it's got to be more than you just declaring a center, opening up a building and putting people in it. It's got to be a partnership between the business, the political, and the education, because that's what really makes it work. There's many of these small towns through the, through the country that have this profile, and I think you're going to see more and more of it. Uh, you, the, the localities you work with must understand what your business is. You know, many of them don't know what technology is, what IT services are. You have to kind of educate. Uh, you have to have a, that close collaboration between the company, the local government, state government, and the colleges, because it's an ecosystem. And you have, you know, that, that 
partnership with a college is in, or an anchor college or, or educational network is very, very important because that is where your raw materials are coming from. You're really looking at being able to influence curriculums, work with uh, placement counselors, and get those people in the training into um, our, our centers. So in, in general, it's been a phenomenal journey, and we will continue to aggressively pursue it. We feel like we're one of the leaders in this, and uh, I'll look forward to hearing Monty and, and others talk about this. Thank you. And any more information, feel free to come to our website, uh, www.cgi.com uh, forward slash onshore, or you, know, you can go through uh, Tech America, and we'll be happy to, to talk to you about it. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Pete, for that um, very informative presentation. Um, up next, we have Monty. Monty? Thank you, Juliana. And uh, thanks to all those attending today. I appreciate your, your time here. And also want to take just a second to thank Tech America and USDA uh, and Ahelia, the company, for uh, putting on a very timely in light of today's announcement uh, out of D.C. Uh, webinar here. Next slide, please. So just as an agenda, quickly, we'll give you a little bit of background uh, about who rural sourcing is and, and some of the things that we do. Talk uh, about some of the trends uh, at a macroeconomic level that are driving the interest now in rural sourcing or domestic sourcing. Um, and then uh, three categories of stories from the trenches of, of what it means to do this, to create these jobs here in the U.S. and to deliver these services uh, from what has traditionally not been technology hubs. The next slide. So who is Rural Sourcing, or RSI? Uh, we were founded actually back in 2004, so very much consider ourselves uh, the pioneer and innovator of this model of going to uh, lower cost of living, higher quality of life locations where we can have a cost advantage uh, and deliver high-end technology services. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those services encompass later. But for us, that really means software development, uh, computer system programming, uh, quality assurance testing of those software programs, and the maintenance, ongoing maintenance uh, of that software. We were founded uh, actually by a former CIO out of Baxter Healthcare. Uh, out of Chicago, who had had her challenges, uh, as we'll say, with the offshore model and making it work consistently. She retired uh, from Baxter. She took her own seed money, went to her uh, home area of northeast Arkansas there in Jonesboro, and began what we know as rural sourcing today. My company, Clarkston Consulting, rural sourcing, we like the model, we love the idea and the concept, and we needed a way, likewise, to reduce the cost of our delivery model for our clients. So Clarkson Consulting bought the company in 2000 and, uh, in 2008, and I left my position there and came over here along with some other colleagues from Clarkson to, uh, to run the organization. We are a pure play, 100% domestic, onshore, alternative to offshore. So we don't have other delivery centers in other parts of the country. Uh, we, we put 100% of our effort uh, on a daily basis, 100% of our dollars, and 100% of our energy into creating these IT technology jobs here in the U.S. We, you know, from a overall idea of what we are trying to do as a company is really change the experience for our clients of outsourcing. Outsourcing uh, has gotten a very negative connotation to it, uh, become a dirty word. And what we're trying to do is change that experience to doing it here onshore and being able to work collaboratively, collaboratively real time with our clients uh, and provide the same cost savings that they might experience or expect uh, having taken the work offshore. We do that by better leveraging the real-time communications, right, uh, by working in collaboration with our clients on a real-time basis, uh, of being able to be at our client sites when we need to be within a drive or, as Pete said, a couple hour flight. Uh, so we cut down a lot on the time to get our software out to 
to our clients uh, and to do it in a quality fashion. Uh, we also reduce the risk. If you think about the risk associated with sending some of your work, your data, uh, halfway around the world, 12 and a half time zones away, uh, those are things that we take completely out of the equation and are able to reduce effectively the cost for doing this uh, need to be the offshore model. We, we want every CIO, every technology buyer out there in the country to be able to, to think about, uh, it certainly won't fit all occasions, uh, but to at least think about the domestic option uh, before they knee-jerk reaction, uh, take this offshore to what has traditionally been the big hub of India, uh, the Philippines for call center and VPO work. Um, we want our BHAG goal, I'll talk a little bit about this later on, our big, hairy, audacious goal uh, is to create 3,000 of these jobs across the U.S. and continue to stamp out these mini high-tech hubs uh, where we can be successful at lowering our clients' costs uh, as well as creating those jobs here in the U.S. Next slide, please. Our services. Um, to tell you a little bit about what we're not. Uh, so we're not a call center organization. We don't today have uh, business process outsourcing as one of our services. Our focus, as I mentioned before, really is on software development, software um, testing, either the new development or the maintenance of ongoing software programs. If you look at our client base today, it sort of falls primarily into three major uh, industry categories of life science and healthcare the consumer and industrial products market, and then finally high-tech and software. We found that a lot of software companies are looking now at a closer to, uh, to their locations alternative uh, to getting some of this work done. Software development in and of itself is as much art as it is science. So the ability to collaborate and to work collectively together in real time uh, really does reduce the time to market for these software companies. Next slide, please. And, and why is this relevant now? So I'll go through the next slide, if you will, Julian, to um, why this is uh, of interest today. So if you look at the overall market based on Forrester's research here, and sometimes it's difficult to nail an exact number on outsourcing. A lot of companies don't want to talk about how much or how little they might be doing. But I estimated it being a $250 billion industry which relative to the sizes of this chart, you can see dwarf things like advertising uh, and even accounting. So it's a significant market today. Next slide. Further, if you look at the clients that are doing that outsourcing and how many of them are happy with those services, uh, the green represents the 50% that are happy. Yellow represents the 13% that are somewhat dissatisfied, and the other third, or 37%, represents those that are very dissatisfied. If you look at that on a totality of a $250 billion industry, $125 million billion of that spend is not satisfied with the services that they get today. And it, I was talking to someone and they reminded me about uh, a question that Richard Branson, who was the founder of Virgin Airlines and Virgin Media and Virgin Telecommunications and a number of other companies under his portfolio, they asked him how he decided about going and selecting which industries he was going to play in. Uh, and his answer, he said, was quite simple. He looked for big industries where there were a lot of unhappy customers. So if you look at this chart, I, I think we found that big industry where there are a lot of unhappy customers today. Next slide. This one was a study on uh, call center, contact center, uh, done a couple years ago, and looking at the domestic versus the offshore um, satisfaction rates. You'll see there that, again, those that are perceived to be done closer to home, uh, with communication skills that are closer to those that are clients that are calling, uh, scored well better uh, than the offshore. Now, what this means, obviously, is higher client satisfaction or customer satisfaction with those call centers. It also means one of the big uh, metrics in call centers is how quickly and can you resolve that 
issue on the first call account. Right? If you have to do it more times than once, then you're actually going to end up costing money. Uh, so there is a real economic benefit to being able to provide a higher level of client satisfaction and higher level of uh, first time satisfaction. Next slide. So one other uh, thing that uh, study that just was released uh, this past couple of weeks is TPI is a um, well-known, well-regarded advisor in the outsourcing space. They've been in that space and a leader in that space for a long time. Each year they publish their top five lessons learned uh, from a momentum geography index. Number two on their list this year was the repatriation of a lot of these jobs back to the U.S. and Canada, uh, and to some degree in the U.K. as well. So those would be three of the leading countries for um, using the offshore model. So those countries and those companies within there are beginning to look at bringing significant chunks of that work back onshore for various and variety of reasons. Number five on that list, and we did put it on here also, the fact for the first time ever since they've been doing this study, uh, they look at the specific geographies, rank them in accordance to um, their viability index for outsourcing. This year for 2011, the United States surpassed India for being that top ranked geography for outsourcing. So it's, it's been wonderful to be a part of this organization for the last uh, three and a half years to see early on when we started a real um, uh, insignificant view of what we could do or could be uh, from a domestic sourcing point of view, now being the number one country uh, at looking at attracting this kind of work here. Uh, so it's been a spectacular growth in a short period of time, but I really do believe that we're still at the very uh, tip of the iceberg in terms of what it will truly turn into in terms of numbers of jobs. If you go to the next slide, what I believe over the long haul, and this may be some, it will be some number of years, is that if you look at that $125 billion of unhappy money that's being spent, if you just take a third of that and say we could bring those jobs and those dollars spent back here to the U.S. to be done here, that would equate to a million jobs back here in the U.S. And that's across a lot of different outsourcing industries and services. But it's still a very significant number that I think, frankly, is, is a reality. Okay, the next slide. That builds up a case of why we think this is, is important. Um, let me share with you just two or three stories here, and I'll try to be cognizant of our time to leave some time for questions at the end, of um, how and why this works. Um, the first one we talk about internally is our colleagues. We go to the next slide. We currently have two development centers. Um, the original one in Jonesboro, Arkansas, and our most recent one, which we uh, just made official or did the official opening in our permanent space there uh, in October in Augusta, Georgia. And in each of these locations, one of the things that we look for, and Pete said this very well, that this is our, our raw materials, right, the people. Who can we attract to work with us to, to help service our clients and their software needs? If you look at our um, colleagues and, and their faith, they really come from three primary areas. Uh, the first are those local colleges and universities, and we work very hard establishing relationships with those universities uh, and putting in internships with those universities so that we can again, early on in their careers to help them get experience and hopefully keep them, retain them uh, as employees once they graduate. We look primarily at uh, four-year degrees, CIS or MIS majors, some engineering as well, uh, to come into the workforce. And they've chosen to be in that area for a particular reason, right? Uh, and it's particularly the quality of life and their roots and, and family that are there that they wanted to stay there. So they make great employees, very low turnover, high motivation to make this success. Our, our second supply of that talent comes from mid-career level IT professionals. Uh, these typically for us are 
tier two, tier three cities where there's 100 to 400,000 people, where there are some mid-level companies there with IT staff, you may find mid-level career professionals who've decided that I don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again uh, throughout the rest of my career. So what we are able to offer those IT professionals are a variety of work. By doing other clients' work, by bringing that work in, they get to see a broad swath of technologies and uh, client opportunities. The third are from what we call our um, road warriors. And these are traditionally people who are uh, consultants, and they go to the nearest airport, and they fly out on Monday, and they return on Thursday. Uh, and it's a difficult lifestyle. Uh, and so for a number of our consultants that fall into that category, we've been able to attract them in to a way of life that uh, has a lot more balance to it. They're able to stay home, come to our office, do their work, not travel. Um, and they're able to uh, extend their careers, if you will, for a significant period of time as opposed to being burned out uh, and doing the travel. The fourth one, and Pete mentioned this, their location in Texas, uh, that we will be now tapping into in Augusta. Uh, Augusta has Fort Gordon there, uh, which does all the uh, communications training for not only the Army, but the other military branches as well. So it has a, a great other load of talent there, both from a technology point of view, from a linguistics point of view, uh, that we'll be able to tap into. The other point that I, I wanted to uh, to make here is that um, one of the things that we provide our colleagues when they join us um, is very similar to a story that I'd heard about Aaron Rodgers, and I'm not sure, apologize if all of you aren't football fans, but Aaron Rodgers was last year's Super Bowl MVP and quarterback of the Green Bay Packers. Out of high school, no one, no college in the entire United States wanted Aaron Rodgers. He got zero scholarship offers. He ended up, he was born and grew up in Chico, California, he ended up going to the local community college to play football there. Um, they went back during the Super Bowl last year and talked to his community college football coach, Coach Rigsby. And they asked him, you know, Coach, what, what did you give Aaron Rodgers here to enable him to compete on the next level? Was it quick step drop? Was it ability to read defenses, uh, quick release? What did you teach him? And he looked at the camera and, and told the audience that, um, I didn't give Aaron Rodgers any of those things. He had all the skills necessary when he came and set foot on this campus. And I did give him two things. I gave him an opportunity. I gave him confidence. Confidence that he could go out, even though he's from Chico, small California, and compete anywhere in this country that he decided to. And so when I look at a lot of what we're able to do with uh, our locations in these areas and taking graduates from Arkansas State and Georgia Southern and Augusta University uh, is to give those graduates an opportunity to compete on a much broader level without having to leave home. Uh, they have the necessary skills, they have the drive, they have the energy. And we're able to give them the confidence to go out there and get the job done. So it's a really rewarding experience from my point of view to be able to uh, help these folks launch their careers. If we do our job right, uh, grow those careers while they stay uh, employed by rural sources. Being a product of a two-stop light town in Mississippi, that's an important aspect of this job for me. Next slide, please. And the next slide we'll go ahead and, and is the uh, story of our, our clients. Now, it's just there's a couple on here uh, that you can read about, read through the slides, but I'll I'll talk to one in particular. Um, recent client who a uh, very large Fortune 100 company who in a particular niche technology has been unable to uh, get the job done in one of their offshore locations. And this is a company that uh, has their own captive center. Uh, they've um, determined in this particular case, this particular technology, uh, that they absolutely cannot hold on to the talent. Their numbers to me were um, over 80% turnover rate, attrition rate within a year. So that means that they're hiring 100 people in the beginning of the year of January. By the time they get to December 31, they're left with 15, 17 of those 
employees. That's not a sustainable model for any business. It's very costly. Uh, and so one of the things that is very appealing about our model is the lack of attrition, the ability to scale those resources in that particular technology and hold on to them. And so it's been um, very rewarding, again, to be able to grow a piece of our business uh, knowing that we, we have some competitive advantage. And that, um, from an economics point of view, we make a lot more sense economically in this case uh, than their other alternatives. Likewise, we've worked with a couple other companies here supporting CRM systems uh, that we compete with other uh, service providers for um, and also have taken some other software companies and supported their enterprise or, or their commercial software applications uh, with their direct customers. So next slide. One, one more and we'll wrap up. Um, Stories from the trenches about our communities. So one of the things that we believe very strongly is, is in giving back to these communities and being an um, economic engine for that community, uh, an incubator, an accelerator for that community, uh, and to help that community itself grow and prosper. And we work very hard at developing those relationships with the universities, uh, with the local um, business leaders, local offices, et cetera. And one of the things that I know we have some economic development people on the line here, um, and don't read too much into my thumb tax here across the U.S. These are actually not real sites that we've selected, um, but to represent what our big, hairy, audacious goal is, which is to establish 30 of these many high-tech hubs across the U.S. Um, but we, when we went through our site selection, for the most recent site um, and ended up in Augusta. We looked at four different states and seven different uh, cities within those. When we went to Augusta, the president of Augusta Tech was at every meeting we attended. The mayor of Augusta was at every meeting that we attended. And in fact, the first meeting with the economic development group and the mayor and, and the uh, president of the university I didn't get 90 seconds into my pitch on what we are and what we do, and he cut me off. He said, I get it, Mike. You're going to bring 100 well-paying jobs to my community. You're going to keep 100 bright, young, educated minds in my community. And then he said, what do you need from me to make that happen? And I'd say that Augusta has lived up to that, uh, that request. Uh, not only did they pitch me that when we were site selecting, I recently brought a uh, prospective client over. Uh, I, this was just after the holidays, and so there wasn't a whole lot of lead time. I called the president of Augusta Tech and said, I've got a prospective client. He'd love to talk, hear your story of how you supply these graduates and, and the programs you offer. He said, absolutely, bring him by my office at 10 o'clock. It would be great. Called the mayor and said, "You know, mayor, I've got a prospective client here at the Fortune 100 company. I'd love to at least introduce them to you. But how about I take you to lunch?" And so I, I tell those stories because of the, the fact that it wasn't just a sales job. It, the support has been there ongoing uh, as we continue to invest in those communities uh, and as we continue both to uh, to grow our presence there. So with that, Julian, I will turn it back over to you, and I, and I thank everyone for your time and attention. Great. Thank you so much, Monty, for that. Um, we're now uh, at our Q&A portion of the, uh, the session. Um, we've had some questions come in, um, uh, most of them for both um, Pete and, and Monty. Um, I'm going to start with the first one here. Um, what are the best aspects of uh, locating um, these centers in smaller communities? And um, what are the challenges that people need to be aware of when they do this? Um, can we start with Pete? Sure. Um, I want to reiterate, reiterate a couple things I mentioned. One is you have to have an area that has a pretty good web of community colleges and state colleges or private institutions because, again, you know that raw material you need to feed these centers are the people. And uh, you're really looking to make sure that you have a, a broad network of, 
of, of educational facilities that you can tap into. Um, I think another thing, you have to have a, a good partnership with the state and local um, elements because there's a lot of things in terms of tax codes and building and real estate and, and even you know the, the local um, government can help you broker uh, dialogues with the education uh, institution. So I, th I think you got to kind of look at it from that. It's not just a matter of picking a location and opening up a building. Uh, I think some of the uh, things you got to watch is you have to make sure that um, you know the, the, the location you pick is far enough away from a major metropolitan area so you don't get drain of your staff uh, or it's too easy uh, for major corporations that are like headquartered in a major metropolitan area can kind of, kind of uh, really kind of suck that talent out. So I think those are some of the things that we watch for. Monty, I don't, you can add to that. Yeah, I think uh, I think the, in terms of the questions of what you get when you locate there, um, you, you get a highly dedicated workforce, highly motivated workforce, um, and, and a workforce that is very uh, amenable and trainable uh, to growing their careers. The other thing in my experience that, that you get when you locate here is um, you really get universities, colleges, community colleges, that are interested in putting their graduates to work. So one of the things that, that we've talked to with um, you know, professors where we've had relationships ongoing is what are the next things that their students need to have, need to learn in order to be employable by you. you know, is that PHP, is it C++, is it web tech, is it mobile technologies? What are those things? And the nice thing is that they're able and they're flexible and they're responsive enough to be able to adjust what they're teaching in those colleges, willing to listen to what we have to say on our input, uh, and be able to turn on those things. You do not always get that at larger metropolitan uh, tenured kind of faculty places. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question around um, the kind of businesses, uh, business processes, or projects um, that are being insured. What kind, in particular, are, are being insured, and do you see a pattern emerging? Um, Pete. Sure. Uh, I think testing is is a huge area um, because you can segment the testing part of any particular project. Um, fairly easily. It needs to be semi-independent from the rest of the project anyway. And it is uh, one of the areas of, of a major system project that has needs for high communication, high touch with the client, the business clients, and also needs a little bit of uh, the business knowledge along with the technical knowledge. And it's something that you could train um, uh, college grads uh, with some training and they can very easily do that and so I think that the testing area is one that is a logical first step. I think uh, upgrades where you're upgrading systems or applications not necessarily from the ground up that's something also that's easily packageable uh, and of course maintenance of those applications plus any back office uh, function um, is like a call center or like, uh, you know, um, there's lots of different things in finance and stuff that, again, you're looking for a cross-section of high communication skills, a bit of business knowledge, and technical knowledge. We have also had success in, in relocating some of our own back office, like all of our human resources uh, back office is in one of our centers. We do our recruiting from, the, from those centers. So it's, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do. Great. Yeah, if I could add on to that, you know, so and I would certainly agree with Pete in terms of the uh, the QA and the testing area is a great area for us. Uh, I think our target is to hit a little further up the spectrum in terms of the uh, complexity of that technology work and actually doing the software development. Uh, so we work with technologies like SAP and Oracle, a lot of business intelligence work, um, other work around custom development, whether it's .NET, SharePoint or Java-based work. So that plays into our entire business model where we believe on an economic uh, total cost of ownership or total cost to deliver that product 
that we can be competitive with the offshore alternative, alternative because of the quick turnaround, uh, the quality right the first time, uh, the ability to collaborate on a daily basis on your time zone, uh, because developing software really is, as I said before, as much art as it is science. And so you need to be able to understand and, and talk back and forth with the client in terms of what their business needs are, and then translate that to the technology side. Um, so we do tend to work um, in those particular sort of higher-end, enterprise-wide technologies uh, out of our development centers today. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question around the rural sourcing trend in other offshore destinations. So there is the similar trend in emerging, uh, which is emerging in, in traditional offshore destinations like India. Um, do you see a potential synergy um, or do you see it as a threat or is it of no concern at all? Um, I'll, I'll take that. I mean, CGI, we have offices around the world, and we actually started onshore in Canada because uh, that's where our roots were. And so we have onshore centers in um, uh, Prince Edward Island, Halifax, uh, that are low-cost centers in Canada that service Canadian clients. I actually also service some of our financial clients, global financial clients that have operations in the U.S. Some of it goes there. So again, it's that model where the, you need onshore centers in all the geographies you're going to work in. We have onshore centers in Spain and in Poland, and you know, you, you, it is table stakes now if you're going to be a major technology player that you have to have both, and you know, from whatever geography you're standing in, you have to have an offshore capability and you have to have an onshore capability because it is all part of the same puzzle. The clients are demanding. You know, I need access to talent wherever that might be. I need a 24 by 7 follow the sun model that I can do coding during the day and then somewhere else when it's a day there, you can do testing and, and so, so on and so forth. So I think it's not a threat. It's just the way of the world. You have to be able to harness it both competitively and to uh, service the clients. Yeah, Julian, and as I <clears throat> talked to some of my former colleagues and other people in the industry, <clears throat> it is absolutely a, a growing <clears throat> excuse me, trend for <clears throat> some of these companies to begin to look at, and really the cost-driven um, effort, right? If you look at the inflation rates for the past two or three years in uh, India, India and the technology sector, it's been between 15 and 20 percent per year. Uh, so as you look at our costs, versus the India cost technology. There's still a gap. That gap has closed tremendously when you look at the uh, services coming out of some of the major uh, hubs there, Hyderabad, Bangalore. Uh, also, you look at the uh, amount of building and the, just the cost of living in India as it's gone up. Mumbai now is one of the most expensive cities uh, in the world. Uh, so that drives up your real estate costs that have to be factored in this equation as well. Um, so I, I don't know that I see it. Um, it, it is, as Pete said, it, it's a natural part of doing business as people continue to look um, for the next alternative to, uh, to take advantage of, of some of the lower costs and keep driving the cost uh, of these services down. Okay, thank you, Monty. Thank you, Pete. Um, we just have a couple minutes left here. Um, we're going to take one more question. Um, in, when, when choosing to uh, locate um, in a rural sourcing community. What is the most important factor for picking one location over another? Well, I, I guess my take on it is there's it's hard to pinpoint one because it's a combination of factors. So you got to look. You have to have a scoring mechanism, um, at, and you have to scout multiple sites, multiple states and then come up with a, with a kind of a scoring card that's a combination of what kind of tax and economic development credits can you get from the local and state level? What kind of commitments do you got to, to do to do that? What are the educational, what's the educational network in that area? What is the cost of living and the mean salaries in those areas and access to that talent? And so you got to kind of put those three together because if one of those factors are way out of whack, 
it's going to probably knock it out of competition for what you need in that particular time frame. So you know, we, we are very diligent in doing that. And so it's not all about, say, the, the, the economic development credits, or it's not all about the education, because you have to have all of that in order to make this work and make it grow. That's my take. Yeah, and I, I would concur with the, most of what Pete said there in terms of looking both at, certainly at the university, the feeder systems, the schools, um, the business environment, business climate there uh, is important to us, the not being too close to another major metropolitan area because that will drive your talent somewhere else or drive up your cost. Um, the one thing that we do tend to shy away from is not building uh, too much emphasis into our business model or even our selection process based on the tax credits and the incentives offered at the government level. Uh, those things uh, can be a little uh, difficult to uh, come by and if administration changes, who knows what's going to happen, right? So we'd much rather build a long-term sustainable business model based on um, what we think the cost of living is going to be, the salaries there, uh, the input of talent, and looking at um, how we would do that necessarily without leaning on any uh, government subsidies. Not that we'll turn them away. Uh, we certainly are interested in talking about them, but I don't want that to be deciding nor a driving factor. Okay. Great. Um, with that, um, we come to the conclusion of our webinar. Um, we'd like to thank USDA Rural Development for sponsoring this web event and our speakers, Pete Derrick and Monty Hamilton, um, for taking the time to share their experiences. And also thank you um, to you, the audience, for, uh, for joining us. We, thank um, you so much. We look, thank you. Uh, we look forward to uh, hosting you actually on our next webinar. As I mentioned earlier, this is the second um, installment of a four-part webinar series, and um, we have the next one coming up on February 8th around um, rural sourcing programs and incentives. Um, please look forward to um, an email follow-up from us with link to today's um, uh, webinar recording. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.